Hello and welcome to the Movers and Shakers podcast. My name is Gino Barbaro, co-founder of Jake and Gino, a multifamily investor, educator, father, and mentor. Today, I get to welcome Mr. Nico Salgado to the show. He's a veteran Jake and Gino member and spent the past 19 years as a Spanish teacher while investing in real estate. Nico began, invest, began investing in real estate in 2012 with the single family development project and has since transitioned into multifamily. He went full cycle in 194 units to date and is currently a GP in a 45 unit value add. Welcome to the show, Mr. Nico Salgado. All right, Gino, I have been waiting for this day. <laughs> Years ago, I said, I can't wait to get on the Movers and Chickens podcast. I'm not ready. I'm not ready. But here we are, man. I'm, I don't think I'll ever be ready, but we're doing it. You know, Nico, I'm still not ready to do a podcast. And this is like my 500th episode. So you just never are ready. And let's just jump in. Why multifamily? What? I mean, you're a Spanish teacher, multifamily Spanish teacher. Those are probably the opposite ends of the spectrum. Yeah. Well, I ran into hardship, you know, I, so real estate was always in my, on my radar, you know, as a kid, even I, I saved money, I rolled up money to, cause I was going to buy a house and, and, uh, this, I, I always loved real estate, but I did, I then never had the really need to, because I had my W2 and I was surviving up until about 2018, I hit some pretty hard times and I, I couldn't really afford my house anymore. And at that point is when I started, uh, thinking about some alternatives. So I read the, the, uh, purple Bible like everybody does. Uh, it's kind of like a, a, a broken record at this point. But I learned about businesses and real estate, which is how I should be investing. And, and um, I ended up starting with a business. I, you know, I, I built a little wood shop in my basement and I was selling cutting boards and other furniture items for a couple of years. And I was burning out. You know, I was at the point where I was working like 20 hour days. And I said, if there's no way I can sustain this. So then I started thinking about passive income as a way to have my money work for me uh, because that was un just completely unsustainable. So that's when I started going back to the idea of real estate. Obviously I, I had done something in 2012, as you mentioned, but it was really 2018 and 19 when I started thinking about real estate again. And I started looking at things where I live in New York, which was duplexes for about eight, $900,000 with zero to negative cash flow. And then I saw a development project, which I thought I could tackle. And then I joined Jake and Gino at the end of 2019. And the first, the first event that I went to, it was three days after joining, I, I got to the Buy Right Bootcamp in, in Atlanta. And the first person that I spoke to said, Nico, I, I was trying to pitch the deal. They were like, Nico, that sounds like a horrible idea, a horrible deal. And thank <laughs> God I didn't do that deal, that development deal, because it would have been a nightmare. And it's still sitting there today in, in where I live. Nobody has done it. You know, Nico, there's so many questions. We can go down so many rabbit holes, but my very first question, and this is important because you are in an area, in an industry that doesn't support entrepreneurism. They probably think you're crazy. Real estate is risky. What are you doing? What did your coworkers, what are the people in your circle say to you when you told them, I'm getting into multifamily, specifically multifamily, not even single family homes? Well, nobody really understood it and, it, and it came across a little bit more of like a Ponzi scheme and I'm getting involved with some weird group, the Jake and Gino community, and, and everybody kind of didn't pay attention to me until a year later, you know, when I'm in a, in a deal and now everybody's paying attention to me. But it, at first it was people didn't understand. And now my, my colleagues, my friends and family, they were like, oh, that's cool. I don't think you're going to make it. I mean, that <laughs> seems like impossible, but go for it, you know? <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks for giving me that, that vote of confidence. And I'll say this again. I did an Instagram reel on this, a short on this, and I started out with real estate is risky. Yes. And who's telling you that? People who have never done a deal. And ironically enough, after you've done your first or second deal, those same people that told you real estate's risky are now asking you to invest in your deals. So stay the course, find a group, Find a support group. And when I say support group, find other people who are like-minded in the industry that are going to say, hey, by the way, real estate is risky. If you don't have a three-step framework, buy right, finance right, and manage right, real estate's risky if you don't know how to invest in an asset. Real estate's risky if you don't have a coach telling you, Nico, are you nuts? What are you doing that deal for? That, 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 
still goes without merit. And real estate's risky if you don't have a coach telling you, Nico, slow down. It'll be okay. Uh, you know, reality. Share a couple of stories. I love the story you just mentioned with me about Darren telling you to, you know, chill out. Things, things are going to be okay. You don't have to do a deal tomorrow. Oh, yeah. I was being extremely aggressive with my, my LOIs, my offer prices. Uh, <laughs> we were only a few months in, and I was like, I, I was talking to Darren. He was my accountability coach at the time, Darren Light. And I was like, Darren, I got to get a deal. I, 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 like I'm, I just need it so bad. And he's like, well, Nico, let me tell you some horror stories about me who jumped into a deal when I shouldn't have or when it wasn't the right time or when I was a little bit too aggressive. And he did. He shared a really interesting story. You know, he went from he went he took over a property that was essentially vacant a, a month or so after he took it over. Everybody vacated. And he said it was a nightmare. So you have to really make sure you educate yourself first and you're getting into the right deal first. So when I underwrite deals, uh, I, I pass them on to people that are better than me to kind of give it a, a once over and make sure I'm not missing anything. Because you know and I know these days, deals are going south. People are, are, have made mistakes because they're not following those, those frameworks, right? Buy right, manage right, manage right, finance right. You have to stick to those basic frameworks or else you could be in trouble. There are a lot of operators today that are in trouble. That doesn't mean that there, you know, that there are ways around that. But you have to educate yourself. And I tell this to people all the time. You have to be in the, in the right group of people. You have to be with people that are actively, you know, making these deals work. So he was like, Nico, just relax. If it takes you, I want you to stop, the, stop where you are, Nico. If it takes you a year to get into a deal, that's a success. And I said, fine, Darren, I will back up off this deal because I was way too aggressive on it. And thank God I didn't go for it. And I will relax. And lo and behold, a year later, I did get into my first deal. Nico, let's talk about that. Uh, and this is for people who are listening who even want to start investing passively. It, it's important that if you're a passive investor, you still need to understand the business, even though you're investing, quote unquote, I look at it as a mutual fund. If, if, if I'm a passive investor, I'm investing in a deal, I'm really passive. The work has to happen on the front end. You need to understand the work on the front end. You need to understand the underwriting. You need to understand the team that the operator has really put together. You need to understand your investing goals. Do they align with the sponsor? You need to understand the business. You need to understand buy right, manage right, and finance right. Once again, if I'm listening to this and I want to start out as a passive investor or even as an active investor, what are some of the things that I need to be doing right now to get into the business? Yeah, what a good question. You know, I appreciate that. I put the work in my first year. I'm going to share a little bit of my experience and then I'll kind of try to tie it in with the rest of your questions. But my first year of, of you know, getting into the Jake and Gino community, my coach at the time was Mike Tarvella and he committed to, you know, I told him I was struggling with underwriting and it was something that I really wanted to get better at. Uh, so he committed to one day a week, seven to eight in the morning, every Tuesday morning to meet with me and review any deals that I was looking at, review my underwriting tweak things, comment on things. And we worked together. It was a year to the day <laughs> that he spent one hour with me every morning from seven to eight in the morning going over underwriting. And it was paramount to my success. I had underwritten hundreds of deals and it was necessary. As an, an active or a passive investor, you have to know what you're doing. You can't just jump into something and take it for face value. The brokers are going to present a deal the way it is, the way they want it to be presented. And it might not jive or mesh with your uh, investment goals or criteria. So Nico, Nico's okay, everybody, by the way. He's at school right now. The bell went off. He doesn't have to go out and he doesn't have to evacuate. He, he's all right. But you know what? That's somebody saying to him, Nico, good job spending 52 weeks on underwriting. It's, it's, it's truly amazing the hour, you know, the, the time that you need to put in. And for some of you out there, it may say to yourselves, Hey, I'm a really good underwriter. I don't need that work. There may be a skill that you may be lacking. Now it doesn't mean that you have to go and focus just on underwriting, but it does mean at least in my opinion and how I started out, you should know the entire business and you should know a little bit about underwriting. You should know a little bit about capital raising. You should know a little bit about speaking to investors. You should know a little bit about the due diligence process. Learn all the facets. Then as you start scaling up, you may say to yourself, I don't want this underwriting thing. I'm going to let someone else look at it or I'm going to you know, look at the deal, review the deal, and then I at least know that business, but I'm going to take care of my business. You know, Mention a couple other things, and I'm going to preface this by saying there's one thing that Nico did that most of us really should focus on is to become the go-giver. Because when I had students coming into the community and I was saying to them, one of the things that you should be doing is create yourself a one-pager. 
and, and Nico was the master, the Canva man. I mean, I would send them over and he would connect with them. And all of a sudden, he's not asking for anything in return. He's just doing it because he likes to help people. And all of a sudden, you make a connection. You make that relationship. You're helping somebody out because you started out at ground zero. Now you have a little bit of experience. Talk a little bit about that go-giver and how it made you feel and you know, all the relationships you've created from that. So important, really. And, and it's hard to really understand what the go-giver mentality is. And I'm actually having Bob Berg on my show as well. Uh, you know, I have a podcast. He's coming in next week. We're going to record. It's going to be put out in a few weeks. But it's hard to understand really what the go-giver mentality is and where your true energy is coming from. And, and it has to come from a place of, I just want to help people because I was in the same exact position and I'm not looking for anything re in return. And you are the master at this, you know. And I'm not, but I'm still trying to, to, to get to that point where I feel comfortable and who I feel comfortable with giving things to. And it's really beginners and learners. So anybody who, who joins the Jake and Gino community or, or anybody that I talk to that is looking to become an active investor or even learn more about passive investing, I try to give them every, all the tools that I have and all the knowledge that I have. And at this point, what do I feel confident in giving them? certain things like one pagers and I can provide them with templates and I, and I even do little videos for people of how to create the one pager and what a broker is looking for and what an investor is looking for. Okay. And then I also provide people with a ton of uh, free underwriting tools and underwriting practice because I, I, I feel so, I guess, grateful that, that Mike spent so much time with me because it's such a big topic. People are so, if you don't understand underwriting, then you're lost. You have to know what you're looking at. So somebody was generous enough to donate their time to me. I now need to, you know, be the go-giver for other people. So I do it a lot. You, if you talk to people in the community, I am on underwriting calls, even with some new members today. Another guy named Nico, he's down in, in uh, Tampa as well, Nico Scaron. I'm on, I, I sent him an underwriting video. We're talking about different metrics and he's learning and I feel good about it. I don't feel like it's a waste of time. And as a matter of fact, on my lunch period, you know, you heard the bell. I'm in school and 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 I'm working, but though this is a time when I feel so happy to be able to give to people like that, and it's just what I can share at this point, and hopefully I can share more in the future. But right now, those are the things that I feel confident in sharing. I love that, and there's a couple of things that I'd like to add with that. Number one, what Nico's doing is he's sharpening the saw, so he's helping somebody else. And big shout out to Nico down in Tampa because I know we went on his first property tour. He's a broker down there. He just joined Jake and Gino. He's on the property tour, almost like. 30 days to the date when he joined, he's already walking properties. He's locked into other community members. That's what it is about the education. It's not just education, it's implementation. He's getting help by implementation, not just from the coaches, but from other community members. And when you talk about the go-giver, it, it's such a hard concept because when we are in the grind and when we're working paycheck to paycheck, when I was at the restaurant, I had less time to think about being the go-giver. But that's when you really should be focusing on trying to help others. And it's not just with money. It can be with a simple gesture. It can be with a simple a simple hello. And it can be with simple just passing on your knowledge. And obviously, when you do become financially free, you say, oh, when I become financially free, I'll have more time. Try to put that into your routine now. Try to build a muscle because it is a muscle. Because what ends up happening is you put your needs aside to help somebody else's. And inevitably... The more people you help when you need time for help, you'll be able to reach out to that person and say, hey, could you help me with this? It is amazing how that is. I know it's very difficult for people to grasp it if they haven't lived it. Read the book, The Go-Giver. We've interviewed Bob Berg twice as well. Go to jakeandgina.com, type in Bob Berg. You'll pull up articles that I've written about him. We've interviewed him twice. Nico, you're going to have a great time with him. I'm going to ask you, what questions do you want to ask Bob Berg? If you focus on that interview, what comes to mind when you're going to be on the on the interview with Bob Berg sitting in front of you? What are you going to ask him? Yeah. One of the main things that comes to mind is what do people feel? Like how can it benefit somebody by being a go-giver? People seem to think of it as a lack and giving something away, like taking your arm off and donating it to somebody. But in fact, the more that you give, and Bob will hopefully reinforce this, will build your personal aura, your personal character, yourself up more than you know. So giving is actually self-beneficial. And that's what I'm hoping to get out of them. And it's interesting because when you give, the other side has to be able to receive. So if Nico's out there giving you something, have the grace to receive it because sometimes we don't feel as if we deserve it or, but he's giving you the grace. And it's interesting as, as I'm thinking this through in my mind and giving it away, you 
you know, sometimes you do it for the wrong reasons. Do it for the right reasons. And, and and the right reasons are just being selfless, just trying to help somebody else out. The wrong reason, at least to my to my mindset, is I want to give something to Nico because Nico owes me something or Nico is going to do me something in the future. Whereas if you come from the mindset of, hey, Nico, can you just send me a one pager? I'd really love to. And then I get that one page over from Nico. I'm like, this is great uh, at making that connection. So it's important that you also come from that mindset of being selfless and thinking, hey, do me, you know, I'm going to do you a favor. I'm going to help you out, but I'm not going to expect anything in return. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, it just feels so good. It's, it's incredible what it does for us. I wake up every morning thinking about how I can, who I can give to, how I can create, you know, a better community around me just by donating and giving. And I think that that's really where our value comes in. Mm -hmm. So Nico, you put in countless hours, you did a ton of work, you became the go-giver. What are some other things that people listening to this, they want to take that next step in the multifamily? What else should they be doing? So throughout the course of my uh, journey, you know, I've had to really go back and forth with which role fits me best, right? And where I fit in on a team and, and what I enjoy. And you mentioned it earlier, you know, sometimes you, you go a year through your education, and then you find maybe you don't really love underwriting, and you want to hand that off to somebody. So then you got to find compliments, right? People that are comp going to compliment your skill set and build a team with them. I think the most important thing, well, let me backtrack, because when I first began my journey, I wanted to do everything alone. And I, that got shut down the first day in the first conversation at the Buy Right Boot Camp that I went to. And it's imperative to be working with other people and leaning on other people, especially given that I, I, I'm still working at W2 and most of my partners are as well. So we have to have complementary skill sets, right? And we have to work together and we have to have similar visions and goals and, uh, and just go after it together. Multifamily is a team sport. Just like a lot of other things in life. I mean, marriage, me and my wife, we make a team. And me and Jake, business partners, we make a team. And the Rand Property Management Company, that's a team of employees. If they're not working together to solve the problem, whatever problem may be, or that solution, it's going to be very difficult. As far as you, I'm going to mention a couple of things that I think that the community has really derived value for its members. And I want you to add on, you know, maybe these may be some that you have learned. But for me, that buy right criteria, understanding the buy right criteria, what kind of assets you're going to be focusing on is so important. The finance, long term fixed rate financing, we've been really preaching about for the last few years. And the manage right, if you can't measure it, then you can't manage it. Those are three things that pop into my head. What have you taken away from the community as far as your education, as far as pillars that you're looking at and you're uh, you're adopting and implementing in your business yeah well so network is is huge and all of the deals that i have done have been with jake and gino members uh, yes there have been some stragglers that are not a part of jake and gino but jake and gino you guys do an excellent job at vetting people up front uh, learning about their personality learning about the type of person that they are and how their work ethic and and all of that so all of my my top partners are from the jake and gino community it is how I got into every single one of my deal by being a member of the, this community and being actively speaking with and connecting with and networking with these members as well. You find people that you mesh with and that's how you get something done. Uh, you, I, you see it time and time again, you know, you'll, you guys help start little accountability pods and accountability groups. And these people will then be together for partners as partners for life. And I think that is paramount to success to be able to lean on others that are doing the same thing you're doing with the guidance of people who are 10, 20 steps ahead of you, right? And then it comes down, it falls back on me to help out those that are a few steps behind me. So it, it is all a community and a network and a br living, breathing environment of successful entrepreneurs that we need to help each other out through. So Nico, what made you want to start the podcast? Well, so that was part of, so there are a lot of asset, uh, facets of being a multifamily investor. And one of them is attracting capital uh, and, 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 you know, my coach at the time, Mark Tarvello, was like, why don't you, he, he pushed me hard for social media and I worked really hard on social media and I still po post a lot on social media. We, we uh, finally honed in which um, social media outlets I like the best. And he also said, why not try a meetup? I did a meetup as well. I still run a meetup. We're four years into it now. Me and Yosef, another member. Um, and I also had to the podcast for two reasons. Number one was for uh, educating myself because I was brand new at the time. 
I was only a few months into my journey when I began it, and I wanted to question the best and top people in the industry and kind of selfishly use that to get questions answered by me. And I also did it to, uh, to, as, a, as a platform to show that I have authority in this space. And it's worked out for both. Now, I will tell people it's not necessarily everybody's route or not everybody should start a podcast because it's not necessarily going to be fruitful and you have to stay in it for a long time and you have to know what you want to get out of it. Me personally, educating myself and building a network and also presenting myself as an authority figure in the space. And it has worked out for that, but it's not necessarily for everybody. What's the name of the show so we can at least promote it here and have the listeners go to it? The Small Axe Podcast. And it's just like the sharpening the saw, it's sharpening the axe. That is awesome. Give me a couple of steps on how you got yours up and running. I think the first one would you know, the first one that I, I like that I heard was really be intentional. Don't be like Jake and Gino and start a podcast and go, like, yeah, we're gonna start a podcast. It's gonna be cool. Cause when we did 10 years ago, almost 10 years ago, let's say there wasn't that many shows on. And we just thought, hey, let's start doing it. I I did it with that intention of just wanting to interview people in the space and learn, but I really had no intention. I wasn't doing it to raise capital. I wasn't doing it to bring awareness. I was just doing it, I wouldn't say selfishly, but I really wanted to learn. Give me some key steps of a person, you know, who wants to start the podcast. And I think everybody should at least try. It's amazing what happens when you get in front of a camera. Maybe you just do audio. If you don't like video, do audio. Start recording. You start talking to other people. You start making those connections. A goes to B, goes to C, and all of a sudden you start meeting a ton of people. And you said network. Networking is a really great way to do it. But what would I? What would you do or recommend for me to start a podcast? Yeah, first think about what you want out of it, and that you might not be totally clear, and that's okay. It might evolve, right? Some people might begin a podcast and then end a few months later, but use that same methodology for creating short short clips here and there and maybe doing more like instagram reels maybe it'll, it'll evolve into something that fits your personality and your needs best uh, but what i did was i ended up you know fumbling for a couple of months saying i know i want to start a podcast but i didn't exactly really know how so i did like a udemy course online about it and i still wasn't ready and then i ended up getting a coach <laughs> So what I did was I used a coach for, it was like a 30 day launch, uh, you know, get you up and running and it worked really well. It was really affordable. And, um, and I would recommend that as well to get somebody up and running quickly. And I could, you know what, here's my proposal, my go giver. I've done this before for people. I have gotten people up and running on their podcast, no charge. I will spend a couple of weekends with you, get you up and running. If anybody wants to reach out to me, I'll take one or two. I can't really guarantee more than that, but I would love to get somebody's podcast up and running. No kudos necessary. Let me just help you out to see if you this would fit you and your needs as well. That is a future business in the making right there. I can see that as a future business in the making where he can systemize it and say, hey, for a couple hundred bucks, I can not I can spend a, a couple hours with you. But by the way, here are five or six videos. This is what you need to do. This is the microphone. I think nowadays it's so much easier easier than when we started because all the platforms make it real easy. I mean, you can go online, you can Google. There are a lot of companies that help you out. It doesn't have to be this labor intensive, money intensive, couple of camera, a camera, a microphone, a couple of lights, a platform like Riverside, or you can even still use Zoom if you'd like, or you know, Streamcaster or Zencaster or StreamYard, whatever. There are so many platforms out there, but don't worry about that. I think the more important thing is that we all have a unique message and we all have amazing stories, but you need to have those expectations set. Nico, what does the future look like for you in real estate? Oh man, so, you know, I wanna do this forever. I feel comfortable and confident, I'm four years in, I finally turned down the volume in my head saying, chill out, this is gonna be something you're doing forever. My goal is to get out of my W-2 within the next 10 years and just do real estate forever. I want to teach my daughter. She's already, you know what she got me for my birth? My birthday was a few days ago. She got me socks that say, that say sold. So her interpretation, she's only eight years old. Her interpretation of what I do is just real estate. So she's seen me at closings. She's joined me at closings. She's seen me close deals. She sees me on calls all the time. And she bought me socks for my birthday. that say closed like a real estate deal. So this is something that I'm going to be doing forever. I am very, very bullish on real estate this year. I think that there I've already seen a lot of deals come to me being offered to me for uh, with with people that had that bridge debt that are struggling and suffering, you know, 
and not that I want to take advantage, but there are deals to be had. And I think that now is an excellent time to buy. If we're going to say that interest rates are historically average right now, they could potentially go down, right? So if we buy now and it's cash flowing now, what is it going to look like in the future? Excellent deals. And for anybody looking to find out what their sole purpose is or what lights them up, all you got to do is look at the reaction that you have when someone asks you a question about something. I mean, Nico lit up like a Christmas tree right there when he said his daughter bought him socks about real estate and clothes. So obviously that's his passion. That's what he's striving for. And that's why he wants to have that go-giver mentality of, wow, I really love doing this genuinely because I really want to continue to get better at that. I want to sharpen the ax. I want to get really good at it. So if you're listening to this and you're struggling with like, oh, I can't find my sole purpose. I can't find my why. Just stop and sit down and think about what you really enjoy doing. And if you can figure that out, these these tactics, these strategies of trying to help other people and trying to find your sole purpose will become a lot easier. My last question to you, and this is important because I know that I've made a ton of mistakes and I will continue to make the mistakes for the rest of my life. You've talked about one or two really big ones, not to get there, itis, and to chill out a little bit and the networking. Do you have any other mistakes or anything else you'd think the listeners would say, you know, hey, this is something I made made a mistake on. I like to shine the light on it. And I can see you laughing because we don't have enough time in the show, but I, I you know what I mean? It's- I got you. Let me say this quickly then. So I hid a deal from Chris Jackson, who was also a coach there, who should have seen this deal. He would have picked it apart. And I ended up losing $60,000 for my team. Uh, we we went in on it together. I hid the deal. I said, this is going to be a good deal. I needed it to happen. And I made a, a huge mistake. We ended up losing 60K. My fault. I learned so much on that. And I should not have hid it from my my uh, my mentors. What was wrong with the deal? Like, like let's construct a deal. Like, what, what didn't you like about the deal? You know, why did that deal fall apart? The deal was excellent. It was actually, so it was a wholesale deal. And that was the issue. We had 30 days to close it. And I didn't understand debt enough at the time to realize that the guy in front of us, we only had one lender working on it, could not make it happen in the 30 days. So what we lost was our hard money down. It was a 50K, yeah. And the seller was not willing to uh, wait for us for all we needed was another 15 days or so. We had all the money lined up. It was an excellent deal, I'm telling you honestly. But I hit it and and had I not hit it, Chris would have said, hey man, this is not right. You gotta gotta negotiate this on the front hand. And I did not, so my mistake. 50 grand is not bad. It could have been 500 grand. I mean, it's just one of those things where that's an important lesson to learn. And what I love about it is you didn't go, you know what? Real estate's too risky. I'm going to quit. If you don't have a strong enough why, that's the reaction to it. It's like, dude, I am out. Peace out. This thing really is. I'm going to listen to everybody. It's not that real estate is risky. It's that when we don't understand the principles, that's what makes it risky. And to evaluate your mistakes, that's what mistakes are. Mistakes are opportunities to take a look at and go, what's the solution here? I shouldn't have done this. This is what I should have done. And now that I've learned that, I'm going to do that. So that's truly important that I think we evaluate and we say, hey, this is what was wrong. I can learn from this. Yeah. I, I, want, to, I want to share one more part of that. So Mike Tarvella in, encouraged me to write a, a blog post about it to get it out of my head because I spent two weeks of not looking at deals and saying I was going to quit. Exactly like you're saying. And he, he encouraged me to write the process out. And I did. And I felt so much better after that. And I was right back in the game. And we actually laughed about it. I said, am I having fun or not? If I'm not having fun, I'm not going to do this anymore. And I said, screw it. I was at a financial, I I needed that money, but I was having fun. And I said, this is a game. And if I treat this like a game and I'm having fun, it's going to be successful from here on out. And I have not looked back. And now we're crushing it. So (laughs) It's interesting because you can either create wealth or you can create excuses. Nico, you could have created the excuse of, oh, it is too risky. I lost the money and I really need this money. But you understood that by making that excuse, you're not going to become successful in this endeavor. And that's for everything in life. If you want to you know, create a great relationship with your spouse or you want to create excuses, you want to create a great, great healthy lifestyle or you can create excuses, you want to have a great you know, life worth of faith, believing in God, if that's what you do or you make excuses, you can have one or the other. You can't do both. So check yourself and say, am I making excuses? Is is it that important to me in life? That's what I think is truly important, figuring out what is what we value and what our value systems are, what our belief systems are. And sometimes we have to challenge our own belief systems by joining a community or by getting out of our comfort zone and understanding it's okay if we have to wait 12 months to get on our first deal. Because even if you've been doing this for four years, put this in this perspective of a child who goes to college 
after four years, they've just graduated. They're out to get a job. If it takes you four years to get two or three deals, I think you're doing pretty good. I think you're way ahead of where most people would be. So any uh, final words, Nico? No, I just want to tell everybody out there, you guys are all doing awesome. Continue doing what you're doing. One step in front of the other, one foot in front of the other every single day. Don't give up. You have friends and family to support you and that love you and that care for you. Be patient. This is a long game, but it's a prosperous game. And we're all going to make it together. Call me, call Gino. We will we'll hold hands. We'll join arms together and, and do this together. Where can the listeners get a hold of you? All right. So my website is smallaxcommunities.com or give me a phone call at 516-660-6912. Nico, brother, thanks for being on the show. This is awesome. Uh, and your podcast again. What was the name of the podcast? The Small Axe Podcast. Yes. Go and check out the Small Axe Podcast as well. You know, some, some thoughts from the, from the show today is ultimately – Think about becoming a go-giver in your life, whether it's to other people who are in business, whether it's to other other family members. If you start thinking about others selflessly without getting anything in return, strangely enough, things start happening to you and start landing in your lap and things start breaking your way when you're willing to help others. Stay in the game for the long term. If you get anxious and you want to jump the gun, go out there and ask others, hey, how does this look? And as Nico did, don't hide. It's okay to show people what you're doing, and it's okay to get out there and ask for advice. Listen, Nico, I want to thank you for being on the show, for being an amazing guest, and we will see you all on next week's Movers and Shakers. Thanks, everyone.